for my wonderful wife. God blessed me with a jewel. Amen. And I'm thankful. I uh I prayed I prayed before we had met, I prayed that God would lead me to the one he had for me and he did that. Amen. And I'm glad that he led me to her. I had dated some other girls that I'm glad I didn't marry. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I praise the Lord for Jeanette. Y'all turn to Psalms 51. As you're turning there, um, there's this husband and wife that have a short conversation. He said to her, when I get mad at you, you never fight back. How do you control your anger? The wife says, I clean the toilet. The husband says, how does that help? She says, I use your toothbrush. <laughs> Two students were talking about their childhood. I was a very clever toddler. By the time I was ten months old, I could already walk. You call that clever? The other one said, I managed to trick my parents into carrying me until I was three. <laughs> There's probably a lot more truth to that than you think. Children are smart, let me tell you. And they do. They do manipulate us. Or at least they try to. And sometimes it works. Maybe sometimes it doesn't. But they're smart. Anyway, Psalms chapter 51. We're going to talk about how you and I respond to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a job to do. And part of His job is to comfort us. But part of His job is almost to do the exact opposite, and that is to convict us. And that's not comfortable, but very necessary. If we don't know we're wrong, why are we going to even put any effort to change? Right? And I'm here to tell you that we all need to change in some area or another. And it doesn't matter how long we've been saved uh, how much we've grown in the Lord, there is always room for more growth. Amen. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 51, verse 1, the Bible says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to Thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of Thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now, by the way, this is David speaking. And look at this next verse. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. What he was saying was, I know I've messed up, and it's really bothered me. It bothers me night and day. I lose sleep over it. I lose joy over it. I lose peace, happiness over it. That's what he's saying. You've been there. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you've been there. I have too. Let's pray and then we'll continue. Father, I thank You for Your Word and I do pray that You would cause Your Word to penetrate our hearts tonight. And Father, we need Your Holy Spirit to show us where we're wrong and help us to see the way out, which is through repentance. Lord, help us to do that. Father, draw us closer to You because of being here tonight in church and hearing Your Word. And I thank You for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> David, as most of you know, had sinned with Bathsheba, and then he had uh, Uriah, her husband, killed. And the Holy Spirit had been dealing with him about it. And so what we're going to do is look at how he handled it. 
This is important. Everybody doesn't handle it the same way. Okay? David's fellowship with God was greatly hindered. We'll see that as we look deeper into the chapter here. <clears throat> but David didn't like it. He didn't like that his relationship with God was hindered. Okay? Um, right here is where a lot of people mess up. We were tempted to sin. Then we sin. And by the way, the temptation offers some pleasure. Satan does not draw us to something that looks bad. He draws us to something that looks good. Or he wouldn't be able to draw us to it. Okay? So because of that, there is some pleasure in it. The Bible says so. There is pleasure in sin. There is a reward. It's a short one. And then it brings consequences. Consequences a lot bigger than the pleasure was. But there is pleasure. So David enjoyed the pleasure. And then the conviction set in. And this is where many times we mess up. And what you do at this point will determine how close your walk with Jesus will be and how happy you'll be. First of all, all people sin. All Christians are convicted by the Holy Spirit of their sin. And then some people repent. Not all people. These people that repent do so because they recognize their sin and they feel guilty for it. And they want to make it right. That was David. The Holy Spirit had open acceptance into David's heart, causing David's awareness of the sharpness of the Holy Spirit's voice to be amplified. This is important. <clears throat> because if we if we grieve the Holy Spirit and block out His voice, then His voice gets quieter and quieter and seemingly farther and farther away. Every time that the Holy Spirit convicts you or I of our sin and we don't make it right, we don't repent, confess it and repent, then His voice gets quieter and quieter. And at the onset, that sounds good. Especially when we're, when we're still enjoying the pleasure of that sin. Because we want to keep on sinning. But then later, the bitterness starts to set in. <clears throat> That's where David was here. For the believer that consistently ignores the voice of the Holy Spirit, they do dull the sharpness and turn down the volume of His voice, resulting in sin becoming easier to live with. <clears throat> this is dangerous. If you would turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to look at an example in the life of Saul. Saul, as you know, was the first king of Israel. And in this chapter, Samuel was told by God to go and find him and anoint him as king. And, of course, Saul didn't know that. He was just looking for the donkeys that were missing. And the guy that was with him said, hey, there's a prophet right up the road here. Let's go talk to him. He can probably point us in the right direction. It's interesting how God, through the circumstances of our life, just kind of pulls things together. You ever notice that? And, and you know, afterward you look back on it and you go, wow, that was neat. But God had a plan like that the whole time. And that's what went on here. Look in verse 21. By the way, they had already met up with, with Samuel. Right here in verse 21, <clears throat> uh, Samuel had already told him that he's going to be the king, and Saul 
Verse 21 says, And Saul answered him and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? What he was saying to Samuel was, Look, you, you don't know who you're talking to. I'm just looking for some donkeys. I, I don't know what you're talking about about being king. You got the wrong guy here. Saul did not have an expanded opinion of himself like we tend to do many times. I do. I don't know why. It's just pride. But he didn't have that. In fact, <clears throat> look in uh, chapter 10 and verse 22. It actually came time for Saul to, or Samuel to anoint Saul and make it public to the entire uh, congregation of Israel that Saul was fixing to be made king. And in verse 22 it says, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither, and the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. Saul was hiding, knowing that I, I just can't. I, I don't know about this being the king stuff. I really think he's got the wrong guy. Maybe if I hide, it'll go away. Amen. Amen. He really didn't. I mean, he was humble. Okay, just to put it straight. Saul was humble. God can use people yes, can. who are humble. Amen. But when we're proud and we think that God ought to be able to use us because of our abilities and our knowledge and our whatever, we're not usable anymore. <coughs> but Saul was in the right frame of mind. He was humble. <coughs> Then something happened. <clears throat> Even though he understood where his power and his ability, his size, his wisdom, and his family heritage all came from, which was God, he was still humble. But turn over to chapter 13. Saul had been king for a year or two. And I think what may have happened was it went to his head. He started to seeing the the power and authority that he had and the respect and the the probably even worship from other people. And it just made him have a, an expanded opinion of himself. Chapter 14, 13, verse 1, Saul reigned one year. When he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan, notice Jonathan, it says there, smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that, Who smitten the garrison of Philistines? Who, who, Saul did it. Saul picked up the trumpet and made a statement that he had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. Now, why would he say that when it wasn't him, it was Jonathan? They were in two separate garrisons, two totally different battles. And Jonathan and his group are the ones that had the victory. And as soon as that happened, Saul seized on the opportunity to get a little bit of praise and glory, picked up his trumpet, and tooted his own horn. I don't think that happened overnight. I think it happened over a two-year span of time. But he got proud. I think that the Holy Spirit probably dealt with him during that two year span of time I'm sure that as Paul, Saul thought about all of this that he has and all of his money and all of his his uh, authority 
And he would just start shaking his head like, I'm the man. And I'm sure when he had these thoughts, the Holy Spirit dealt with him and said, no, you're not. And Saul blocked it out. And I believe that happened over and over. We normally don't make super bad decisions all at one time. It normally follows or is followed because of a bunch of smaller decisions that lead us to that big one. And for that reason, it's important that we recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because if we can't hear Him saying to us, that thought was wrong, you need to repent of that. That word you just spoke against that person, that was wrong. You need to repent of that. And many times we justify it and we just brush it off. Be careful. That's dangerous. Because it's going to lead to a bigger one. And then a bigger one. And then a bigger one. And many times, by the time it happens, you and I look at this and we go, how in the world could they do something like that? Well, it's quite easy. Because they took a path of a bunch of little decisions that led them to that big one. I believe that's what Saul did. But he kept blocking out the Holy Spirit. And as you know, the rest of the story, he continued to make even bigger and bigger decisions. He went and he, he inquired of, of uh, witches to find out if they needed to go to battle or not instead of praying and asking God and talking to Samuel. Then he was disobedient against God and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Till finally, the Bible says that the kingdom was rent from his hand. By the way, so was his joy, his peace, his family, even Jonathan, who was a good man, a righteous man, a godly man, died prematurely. And I believe it had something to do with Saul. <laughs> but David, he's a different story, isn't he? The results of repentance here in Psalms 51. We all have a desire for peace and joy, love, healthy relationships with those that we love, good reputation, respect, and trust from others. We all like those things, right? Amen. We want those. Amen. But Satan desires the opposite. By confessing and forsaking our sin and choosing to be obedient to God, our joy will be restored, as it says in verse 12. But turn back to Psalms 51. <clears throat> I like this chapter because I have, uh, I've had to live it several times where that I've messed up. And I've had to go to God and confess. Make it right. Repent. In verse 12, David said here, <clears throat> well, back up to verse 10, he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Remember, David is just like us. He desires to have good relationships with the people that he loves. He desires peace. He desires joy. He desires fulfillment of life. You can't have all those things and sin at the same time. They don't live in the same house. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from Thy presence and take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of Thy salvation. He lost His joy. 
Did he have the pleasure? Yeah, for a short span of time. But it was gone. It didn't last long. And then he starts recognizing that his joy is also gone. His peace is gone. <clears throat> this is important. Because how we deal with the Holy Spirit is going to determine our level of joy. Right. Our level of peace. <clears throat> then he says this in verse 13. After praying for God to create in him a clean heart and to restore his joy. He said in verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. <clears throat> when we confess our sin, whatever the sin may be, and we repent of that sin, and we make things right with God, all of a sudden, we have, a, we have joy again. We have that peace. We have fulfillment of life. We have the uh, good relationship with those that we love. But we also have a desire to be a soul winner. That's what he's talking about here in verse 13. He said, Sinners will be converted unto thee. Why? And what is this? What's the difference? What's the, uh, the the game changer in David's life? He had lost his joy. He had lost his his peace. It's very likely he was not seeing con sinners being converted to God. It's very likely he was not being the soul winner he ought to be. So I have a question for you: Are you being the soul winner you ought to be? When was the last time you talked to someone about Jesus? Could it be that there's something in your life that ought not to be there? David prayed a prayer, not in this chapter, but in another one, and he said, God, search me. Know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. I need to know. I, I, I don't see it. I'm blinded to it. I need you to open my eyes and show me where I'm wrong so that I can repent. <clears throat> Maybe that's what you and I need to do. We need to repent of something and we don't even know what it is yet. We ought to pray that prayer that David prayed. Or else we're not going to know. I just know this. David was not being the soul winner he ought to have been until his joy was restored. And that wasn't restored until he repented of the sin. <clears throat> I'm afraid that our churches are filled with believers that seldom lead a soul to Christ. <clears throat> I know I don't lead in as many as I should. There, there, there's days and maybe even weeks that go by that I don't verbally talk to somebody about Jesus. And I'm just, I'm not proud of that. I'm just confessing something openly here to you. And it's very likely because there's probably something in my life that I need to repent of. <clears throat> in order to make things right with God, we got to know that there's something wrong with him. Or else we're not going to fix it. We're not going to repent of it. When the Holy Spirit deals with you about something, that's a good thing. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. It'll require change. And we hate that. But the results are real good. Our joy will be restored. Our peace will come back. We'll have the desire to talk to other people about Jesus. And by the way, you'll probably never experience the kind of peace and joy and fulfillment of life any better than when you lead somebody to Jesus. 
Now, I think you know what I'm talking about. Look for those opportunities. The problem is when we're in sin, we don't want to talk about Jesus. It's convicting. We've dampened the voice of the Holy Spirit well enough that it, that doesn't bother us too much anymore. But to bring His name up in conversation is quite uncomfortable when we have sin in our life. That needs to be corrected, whatever it may be. And if we've been in it long enough, like I said earlier, we, we get numb to it. We get blinded to it. We don't even recognize it as sin anymore. And we can't make things right until we recognize that there's something wrong. So we're going to stop, and we're going to pray, and we're going to have an opportunity to make some of that stuff right. Let's pray. Father, I do thank You for Your Holy Spirit. And Father, I need Your Holy Spirit to guide me, to point me in the right direction, to show me where I'm wrong and what I'm not doing right, and what I need to start doing that I'm not doing. Father, I pray that Your Holy Spirit and His voice will be clear and loud in my ears. Lord, I pray that You would help me to see the things that I need to change so that I can be the kind of soul winner, soul winner that I ought to be. And I thank You for that. I pray this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen.